Good morning, Elevate Life. Um, some of you have been in our church for a while, and so you're always surprised whenever I'm not wearing all black, and thank you. But we like to have fun. We like to have fun here at Elevate Life. Some of you are like used to churches that it's like the frozen chosen, you know, it's like we're not here to have fun, we're just here to be really serious, and you know, I think heaven's going to be a fun place to go, you know. I'm not trying to go to another business meeting. I'm not trying to go to a board meeting. I'm not trying to go to a shareholder meeting. I'm trying to go have fun for the rest of my life and trying to have fun in eternity. So we think Jesus is a fun guy around here. So one of the things I want you to do, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right in, but um, we, have a, we have an app, the Elevate Life app. You can get notes. If you're watching online, live.elevate.life, you can get those notes. And then also in the U version app, you can get notes as well. So today we're talking about, I want to talk about the advent of greatness. And some of you know what Advent is, some of you don't. We don't really necessarily talk about Advent a lot. The history of Advent is really interesting, kind of, if you like church history. It's really more in uh, what's called liturgical churches, like Lutheran churches, Methodist churches, Catholic churches, and so on. But Advent is uh, a Latin word, and all Advent means is the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. And so today we're going to talk about the advent of greatness in our life. Advent in the, in the early church was a season. It was like from the end of November to Christmas Eve. And uh, churches would talk about what they called the three arrivals of Jesus. And the three arrivals of Jesus are the arrival of Jesus in the past, which we know of. That's what we're celebrating in, in this Christmas season. That's the arrival of Jesus 2,000 years ago to the earth. Then the present arrival, which is the arrival of Jesus in our personal lives. And then this, this future arrival, like one day we believe that Jesus is going to come back and that he's got a plan for the earth. So, th- so throughout this season, early churches would do all kinds of, they established all kinds of traditions. They would light what's called Advent wreaths. Some of you use Advent calendars in your home. Advent calendars were originally established for the purpose of helping to remind people every day throughout the season that Jesus is here and Jesus is in our life. The people would pray through a devotional. And then um, in Advent, you can light something that's called a Christ tingle. And that sounds uh, oddly inappropriate, but you can, <laughs> you can light a Christ tingle if that's something that you would like to do as a part of Advent. Uh, you can Google that. I hope it's not inappropriate to say Christ tingle in church. <laughs> so there's a lot of great traditions around Christmas, but I like the idea of Advent because it's all about expectations. And a lot of Christmas is about expectations, right? So gifts, family, heading into the new year. We're going into a new year. We're coming to the end of the year of promise. We're expecting, you know, January is just the best time of the month to go to the gym. It's like, I'm gonna get my life right. I'm gonna get things set in place for the first time. I know I haven't been doing it for five years, but this is my year, right? We, we just set these really great expectations, and I, and I think that's a great thing. So the story of Jesus, here's what like Advent, like the, the, this concept of arrival, the arrival of Jesus, reminds us. Here's what Jesus reminds us. Everything can change in an instant with the arrival of greatness into our lives. Like have you ever met a great person, like one day you were just going through life or you showed up somewhere and you met a person who's like, this person, just me meeting this person or just me getting to be around this person changed my life. Or like you've gone to an event before, maybe you've gone to like a, like a coaching event or some kind of motivational event and you were there and you heard someone say something and the thing that they said shifted your thinking forever. You know, Jesus is like the first version of that. Jesus is the real version of that. He's the real source of that. And so this season of Christmas, you know, reminds us that great things can happen in our lives. Great things can show up in an instant that change things forever. And so we look at the book of Luke and in, in Luke chapter 1, you kind of have this starting story of Jesus coming to earth. And I want to paint you a picture with these 12 verses uh, about Mary. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to paint a picture. So God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in, the, in, a, in a, village, a, vill, a village in Galilee to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be, engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, (laughs) Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. 
Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever, and his kingdom will never end. Then Mary asked the angel, how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And some of you know the rest of the story. Then at the end, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left. So, again, this is a passage of scripture that even if you haven't been in church, you're probably familiar in some uh, form or fashion with the idea that God was born of a virgin. An angel showed up to Mary, said, you're going to get pregnant. God's going to impregnate you. And then it's going to be amazing. And uh, what's interesting to me is that this angel shows up, you know, I imagine in my mind, I don't know what it was actually like. We don't have video of that moment. But I imagine she's just sitting in her house and all of a sudden angels in the room is like, greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Hang on. Whoa. I don't know if you're an introvert. I'm an introvert. I don't need you to greet me with loud noises. The book of Proverbs says to greet someone in the morning with a loud noise will be considered a curse. That's what it says. I've gone on trips before with people gone on missions trips with them. You know, there's always people who are just super chipper. 6 a.m., hey, everybody, good to see you. It's like you are cursing me right now, <laughs> wearing me out. I just woke up. I need about three hours to get going, and then I'll be ready to do whatever exciting stuff you're excited about today. So this angel shows up. Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. I love, I love how human that the Bible makes Mary's response because her response is confused and disturbed. Angel shows up, confused and disturbed. This is how a lot of people live their life. Confused and disturbed. So God says this. Here's, here's what God says in our life. Like an angel shows up in, in our life. The, the, the God, God, some of you have a relationship with God or you pursue God or in some level or form or fashion you have a God consciousness and you're still walking around confused and disturbed, although God's saying about you, you're blessed and you're favored. But we're still living life confused and disturbed. Mary is in there, her house, and instead of saying, oh yeah, that's amazing, thank you God, like I'm blessed and highly favored, she's just confused and disturbed. Have you ever had the opportunity for something and you were just too focused on something that didn't matter, and you missed out because you were focused on some little problem or irritations? You know, when I was in... Uh, college, I had a friend of mine who called me one day and he said, hey man, I got, I, got front, I got front seat tickets to the U2 concert at Texas Stadium and uh, the person I was going to go with dropped out and I'd love for you to come, and, but we got to leave in like 30 minutes. I was like, man, I'm in the middle of my workout at the gym and I just, I don't know, I don't think I can, I don't think I can make it. He's like, dude, it's U2. I'm not really a U2 fan, but their, their concerts are just the best concerts in the world. They spend so much money on their concerts. Front row seat, dream, dream opportunity. And I just got really focused on like this little thing I was doing. Like, oh, I'm at the gym. I'm not going to come. He's like, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, it makes sense to me because I'm focused on this little thing right now. Like some of us, we have really great opportunities that are staring us in the face. But we're so focused on little irritations and little problems that we feel like we can't take advantage of the opportunity because it's just the little thing that we're dealing with today. And God's trying to like expand our thinking. There's so many stories I could tell you. One time a friend of mine, a, a great, well, a mentor in my life, Erwin McManus, he FaceTimed me. And I don't really talk to people over FaceTime. I've, my friend Steve Weatherford is kind of, and my dad are the only two people I FaceTime in my life. Me and Courtney don't even FaceTime. She didn't even like to talk to me on the phone. I, I'm fine with that. We're both introverts. Texting is great. So my friends know I have a strict no-call policy. Well, Pastor Irwin, he, he FaceTimes me one time, and he's like, hey, I'm in Dallas. And I thought he was trying to get a hold of my dad because him and my dad are friends. And uh, I said, well, do you need to get a hold of my dad? He's like, no, I'm trying to get a hold of you. I said, oh, wow, that's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I didn't know it was that big of a deal. So he says, hey, we, we just landed in Dallas. My son, his son's name is Aaron. Aaron missed his flight, and we're going to the World Series and it was like a few years ago when uh, the World Series was at the new Ranger Stadium. He goes, we're going to the World Series, and I have a ticket, and I want you to come. And I was like, oh, I'm at work right now. <laughs> so it's like, he's like, you got to, it's 4 o'clock. I don't want to go through Dallas traffic. It's like, that's all the stuff I'm thinking in my mind. I'm going to go through all this. And so he, he stops, and he's like, Josh, what are you saying? Just come to the game. It's the World Series. I was like, yeah, Pastor Irwin, I'm just not really a baseball guy. He's like, I don't need you to be a baseball guy. 
I'm inviting you to the, to the greatest baseball game ever. You, you don't have, just come, just take advantage of the opportunity. So I did, and it was amazing. It was in a box. It wasn't in just some seats. It was like the coolest thing ever. And I imagined in my mind how many times in my life I've missed out on such great things because I was thinking about all the little stuff I was doing that I thought was so important when there's this really great opportunity. So the angel, so the angel says to Mary, blessed and highly favored when she's confused and disturbed. You found favor with God. One of the definitions of favor that we have in this church is a divine assigned advantage for success. Now, if you have a relationship with God, this isn't true for everybody, but if you have a relationship with God, you have a favor on your life that can be attached to that. And I want to talk about that today. But the angel says something that confirms the plan of God for Mary. He tells her about the advent of greatness, the arrival of greatness in her life the arrival of Jesus. So why, did, why is Mary blessed and highly favored just because who she is and just because she's a great person and she works really hard and she's a nice girl? No, she's blessed and highly favored because God has decided that she has a role in his plan. So I'm going to tell you why you're blessed and highly favored because God has decided that you get to play a special role in his plan. So... What makes Mary so special? What makes her so blessed and highly favored? Her role in God's plan. And what was God trying to do with Mary? What's the first thing that he did with, with this whole thing? He raised her expectations out of herself and out of his plan. Why? So, so to go back, God says, you're blessed and highly favored. And then the angel says, here's what's going to happen. You're going to have a son. He's not just some dude. He's not just some kid that's going to come to the earth. This son is the son of God, and he's going to change the world forever. And I need you to have an expectation that this is going to happen. Why? Because there's a universal truth in life. You get what you expect out of life. So, so I, want to, I want to paint this picture. It's not about what you want. It's not about what you need. It's about what you expect. So here's how we live. Here's how, here's how uh, you know, I'm not allowed to say stupid anymore from the platform. So here's how silly people teach us to live. Silly people teach us to live like this. Low-level people teach us to live like this. If you have low expectations, you'll never be disappointed. Man, what a horrible life. Like you could, you could, some of the people that live life with low expectations and never get disappointed, they could film a movie about their life called A Horrible Life. A useless life, a waste of a life. It's not a wonderful life. It's a low-level life. Don't we all want that? That's amazing. Because here's the, here's the thing that we think in our default mind by ourselves. I just don't want to be disappointed. I don't want to have things in my life that are disappointed. So I would rather diminish and focus on being small and just whatever, quesera, sera, whatever will be, will be. I'm not that big of a deal. Nothing's that big of a deal. It doesn't matter. Here's, the great, here's a great question to ask yourself. Do I want to be great or do I want to avoid disappointment? Because I'm going to get disappointed. There's going to be times in my life for sure where I experience disappointment. But if I expect greatness, if I expect greatness out of myself, if I expect greatness in my future, then yeah, there's going to be disappointments along the way. But man, life is going to meet me at the level of my expectation. What did the angel do first? He set Mary's expectation. He didn't say, you're going to have a kid. It's going to be fine, and he'll be okay. And he won't, he'll just be an all right guy. He said, you're going to have a son, and this son is going to be called the son of the most high and said all of this stuff. First, he set her expectation for herself. So he didn't just start with, Mary, you're going to have a son. He said, blessed and highly favored. Mary, you're blessed and highly favored. I need you to see yourself this way because you're going to be the mother of greatness. And great people are the only people that can reproduce great people. You can't be a low-level person and produce a high-level person. Some of us, we want our kids, we want people that come after us to be better than us, but we're not giving them anything to follow. So parents live life with this mentality. It's like, hey, do as I say, not as I do. And your kids are just going to do what you do. The great thing is if you're a great person, if you set a great template in place, if you live life with followable excellence, then what happens is everybody, whether it's your kids, your, the people that work for you, whoever, everyone gets in your draft and chooses to become more like you. 
So what did the angel do first? He set Mary's expectation because her expectation was going to determine uh, her expectation was going to determine how she would treat Jesus as her son. So what you expect determines what gets your focus, and what you focus on shapes your perspective. So if I expect to be disappointed, and this is like, you know, again, some of you know me, some of you have been in this church for a while, some of you haven't, and that's, and that's okay. So like, I, I naturally am very cynical. I'm naturally kind of negative. I fight that every day. And uh, I work really hard on being positive. I have, a, I have a dad who models that for me, teaches me to be positive. Here's one of the things that I've learned in life. If I expect negative things to happen, negative things, I notice negative things a lot more often. If I expect positive things to happen, I notice positive things a lot more often. And, and maybe in life, so, so this has been true for me. I don't know if it's true for anybody else. But maybe in life, it's 50-50, Maybe in life, 50% of what happens to me is good and 50% of what happens to me is not preferable. But if I get out of life what I expect and I expect bad things to happen, I could have five really good things happen and one bad thing happen and I become so fixated on the bad thing that I think now everything is gonna be bad because this one thing is bad and I'm not noticing the five good things that are happening. But if I become focused on great things, if I have great expectations, if I say things are gonna work out, then what's going to happen? My mind is going to focus on all the things that are working, not all the things that aren't working. It's the secret of life. I can focus on what's working. I can focus on what's not working. And what gets my focus shapes my perspective. And what gets my focus is what I get more of. This is what what negative people don't realize. They're like so tired of being negative, but they keep focusing on negative stuff and all they get is more negativity. So here's one of the things that we teach here at Elevate Life. This is a model that we use Your thoughts plus your attitude plus your actions will always equal what you have in life. Think plus be plus do equals what you have. Like this triangle right here, we call it a triad. If you spend time in your life thinking about all of the things that you can't control and you think about the things that you can control and you write them down on a piece of paper, doesn't matter how much time you spend, you're going to come up with basically three main categories of what you can control. Your thoughts, your attitudes, and your actions. You can't control anything else. And what we teach here is your think plus your be plus your do will always equal what you have in life. Now here is the, what I'm not saying about expectations. Because a lot of people live life with some really high expectations, but they expect way more out of other people than they expect out of themselves. And that's the problem. So where did the angel start with Mary? The angel started with Mary. Expect something out of yourself. Blessed and highly favored one. And then we're going to talk about what you can expect out of Jesus. So here's an open secret. Expect it out of yourself, not other people. What, 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 what God wants us to do. So here's the, here's the problem. Here's the problem of expectations. The problem, and this is why a lot of people say, hey, if you have low expectations, you won't be disappointed. Because you should, you should expect less out of other people than you expect out of yourself. You should expect way more out of yourself. Now, immature people, they expect way more out of everyone else. Like, I'm not going to pull my weight. That's why I need you to pull double weight. I'm not going to do my part. That's why I need you to do my part and your part too. The problem with expectations is expecting more out of others than we do out of ourselves. And these people get less out of life than they expect because they refuse to take responsibility for themselves. So there's some people that are sitting here hearing what I'm saying, and they're saying, well, you know, Josh, you said I'm going to get out of life what I expect, and I've expected a lot, and it's never happened. Yeah, because you're expecting something out of what you can't control. You can't control that person you're married to. You can't control what's happening all the time in your business. What you can control is what you expect out of you and how you perform according to your own personal expectations. So I'm going to get out of myself. Ultimately, I'm going to get out of myself what I expect. If I expect that I'm going to be great, if I expect that I'm going to be smart, if I expect that I'm going to be wise, if I expect that I'm going to succeed, and I, and I live my life trying to level up to those expectations, those things are going to happen for me. If I expect someone else is going to do this for me, and someone else is going to be this way, and someone else is going to be that way, and this person has to do this, and this person has to do that, man, I'm going to live my life disappointed because it's all about other people. It is so easy 
and silly to just live your life expecting more out of other people than you do out of yourself. And that's the way the world works. That is the most entitled person that you know. What, what is entitlement for them is I expect all this stuff out of you and I expect nothing out of me. So what, did, what happened? The angel told Mary to expect more out of herself so that she could be great enough to make greatness happen on the earth. Mary had Mary and Joseph, and this is just kind of a, this is a philosophy that I have. This is my opinion. Mary and Joseph had to be good enough to raise the Son of God. They had to be good enough parents to make sure they didn't mess Jesus up when he was a little kid. They did. And, and so many of us, we have kids, we have children, we don't treat them like they're special. We don't treat them like they're a gift from God. Or like maybe you're, you're a kid, you're, you know, growing up with your parents, they just didn't treat you like you're special. We're just normal people. There's so many people that they, it's like, it's so frustrating. There's so many people, they live life and they treat their kids like, hey, we're just mediocre and we're just normal and we're not special like all these other people. What? Yes, you are. You have a fingerprint that nobody else has, leave an imprint that nobody else can leave. This isn't about, hey, we're not rich or, hey, we don't have, we don't live in this neighborhood or, you know, whatever. We don't drive this kind of car. But what you can do with your kids is you can say, man, you have greatness on the inside of you. You're destined for something amazing. God has a great plan for your life. And the only way you can do that is if you believe it about yourself. If I expect out of myself that God's got a great plan for my life and God's going to work all things together for my good and man, my life is going to be so beautiful and my future is going to be amazing, then what I can do with everyone that comes after me, whether they're my kids, my employees, whoever, what I can do with everyone that comes after me is look at them and go, hey, I've seen this happen in my life and you can too. So what do you expect out of yourself? What do you expect out of your life? Some people expect haters. So all they see around them are haters. It's like, I just expect I'm going to get hated. Cool, man. That's what you're going to see, all the people that hate you. You're going to be all up in your comments, responding to every comment that someone, some random person has about some random thing that you said that doesn't matter because they're just going to move on to the next outrage. Some people expect to be taken advantage of. So all they do is they look around in their life for all the ways that they're being taken advantage of by everybody around them. You're taking advantage of me here. You're taking advantage of me there. You know, when I was 16, I got my car taken away. Um, <laughs> that was the end part of the story. I probably should have started with the beginning. <laughs> but but uh, I got tired of taxiing my sisters around. So I had this car. I didn't pay for it. I didn't pay insurance. I wasn't paying for gas. And, you know, my parents told me, they're like, look, you know, whatever your sisters, you know, need you to do for them, I need you to, to drive them around. So I'm driving them to the mall, taking them to cheer practice at 7 a.m. before school. <laughs> and I'm like, I told my mom, this is just, again, I can call myself stupid. This is the stupidest thing ever. So I... I told my mom one day, I'm like, I'm not doing this anymore. She's like, what do you mean? I'm not driving them around. Y'all can do it. They're your kids. Woo. Right? Great idea, son. You're going to win with that philosophy. So, um, so my, dad, my dad calls me, right? He wasn't there. He was like traveling or something at the time. <laughs> so, you know, my mom's like, I'm just going to call your dad because I don't know how to deal with your insanity. You know, it's like too stupid for me to even process what's happening right now. <laughs> so my dad calls me and he's like, so tell me about this, all this, what's going on? I'm like, look, they're just taking advantage of me, dad. It's all they do. It's all my sisters do. They just take advantage of me. So my dad's like, who bought your car? Well, you did. Who pays for the insurance? You do. Who pays for the gas? So you do. Okay, what I want you to do is what he said. I want you to go out to my car, get all your stuff out because I'm selling my car today. I'm like, well, no, it's my car. He's like, it's not your car, it's my car. I'll let you drive my car. So what, how am I going to get to school? He's like, I don't know. you got friends that got cars. They can come pick you up. Your mom's going to take care of your sisters. You need to take care of yourself now. That was a rough time in my, in my, I mean, it didn't get taken away forever. It got taken away for a good while, though. So here's how some of us live. Everything that God, everything that you have in your life is something that God's given you. And you can choose to be a person that says everyone in my life is just trying to take advantage of me. Or you can choose to be a person that says, you know what, I'm the most generous person I know. 
because I give to everybody that I know. And that's my expectation out of myself. So you don't got to repay this. You don't got to give this back to me. I'm just glad to be a person in your life who can bless you. Here's what some people say about themselves and say about their life. Man, I'm not good enough. I'm never going to be good enough. I don't know if I'll ever have what it takes. You're going to get out of life what you expect. If you expect to not be good enough, you'll never be good enough. It is what it is. Que sera, sera, man. Life just is what it is. Well, that, if that's your expectation, life's going to meet you at the level of your expectation. It's always been this way, and it'll never change. Nothing will ever be different. The world's not going to get better. The world's going to get worse. I don't believe any of that stuff. Cancel that in your life. Be the kind of person that says, you know what? The world's going to get better. That's my expectation. My expectation is that I'm, I'm here, man. Like you're telling me, <laughs> you're telling me we got a room full of people here today. We got people that are watching online. You're really great. You're probably better than anyone that's ever been on this planet before. And you're going to tell me that the world's getting worse because you're here? No, man, the world's going to get better because we showed up. That's what I want to believe about myself is that God has put me on the earth. God's put me on this planet for such a time as this to make the world a better place. That's got to be your expectation out of you, and that's got to be my expectation out of me. So I had a conversation with someone recently in my life, and here's four things that they expect. They expect to be rejected. They expect to be ostracized. They expect to be disrespected, and they expect to be disliked. Guess what? They get rejected a lot. They get cut out a lot. They get disrespected, and they get disliked. Why? Because that's how they act. They behave in a disrespectful manner so people can't respect them. They behave, they behave in a way that convince other people not to like them, so therefore they're disliked. Why? Because that's what they expect. You're going to get out of life what you expect. If you expect people to not like you, you're going to act in a way that makes them not like you because life will meet you at the level of your expectation. So... They think that they're going to be disrespected, so they have a disrespectful and distrusting attitudes towards other people, and then they behave in a manner that's undignified. Guess what they have? More disrespect. So here's what the arrival of Jesus reminds us of. That we can expect greatness. If I expect greatness out of myself, guess what? I'm on the journey. I'm on the road toward becoming a great person. We can expect and we should expect greatness in our own lives and in the other and in the lives of other people. We can expect a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us to do that in scripture. Think about Jesus and Mary. You know, we're gonna have this amazing Christmas production, drummer boy, just unbelievable. It's gonna like it's gonna like blow the doors off. Pastor Keith calls it slam bang theater. It's gonna be amazing. Jesus didn't come to the earth with a big show. There wasn't a choir there. There wasn't like, you know, fireworks and all kinds of stuff that happened. Jesus was born in a manger, right, to a mom who was confused and disturbed. The name Jesus was more common back then than it is today. Some of y'all know a lot of Jesuses. But Jesus, <laughs> Jesus uh, is, is another term. Jesus is like a translation of the name Joshua. And I don't know how long Josh's, Joshua's been a popular name, but everywhere I go, I meet about 10 Joshes. When I was in elementary school, I had to go by JC because there were too many Joshes in my class. Every Josh wasn't even allowed to go by Josh because there's like five of them in here. So Jesus' name was not, was a common name back then. I mean, he's born in a, in a beyond, like beyond, you know, way less than common situation. The guy's born in a barn, like literally, Right? So here's, and, and in Jewish culture, Jews have a hard time accepting Jesus as the Messiah because of how humble his birth was. Because in Jewish culture, the Messiah is the king, he's the king of kings, he's coming to be a revolutionary. Well, a dude born in a cave somewhere is not really going to, on the trajectory, to become a revolutionary. So even for Jesus, what makes Jesus so special is not where it started, it's where it ended. It all started with expectations, but it ended with greatness. So here's another secret in life. You can't want greatness but expect insignificance. And there's a difference between wanting something and expecting something. I want to paint this picture. So wanting versus expecting. I'm expecting a child. You can expect something when you've done your part. I want a child. That's just a wish. I'm entitled to it because I desire it. So a lot of people say they want stuff. 
I want this, I want that, I want that thing, I want that thing, I wish for this thing, I wish for that thing. Expectations come when I'm willing to do my part. And this is what the angel was saying to Mary. Blessed and highly favored one, you're going to have a son, and I need you to expect some great things out of yourself so that you do your part to be the kind of mom you need to be. This is how too many people live their life, thinking that a wish is an expectation. They think that being great would be a great idea if only they weren't so insignificant. Man, I would love to be great, but Josh, you don't know my situation. You don't know where I came from. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know my trauma. That should be a four-letter word. It's not a four-letter word. It's a five-letter word, but it should be in the list of curse words. People talk about trauma way too much. Some of you, you just had a parent who was a knucklehead. You didn't go through trauma. There's some people that have gone through way more than you that are succeeding way more than you because of how they see themselves versus how you and I see ourselves. It's just the truth. So if I think that my status, my influence, how I was born, my parenting, the school I went to, no one believed in me, if I think that all of that stuff is what's prevented me from succeeding, then I'm right. If I think that all that stuff is rocket fuel for my future, then guess what? I'm going to be right too. All that stuff that I went through, all that stuff that I've been through, whatever those things are, those are going to set me up to win in life. The story of Jesus and Mary reminds us that greatness does not come in the form of influence or status. Greatness is, comes from who we are in God. God created you. God has a plan for your life. If God did not want you to be on this planet, you wouldn't, want to be, you wouldn't be on this planet. If God didn't want your breath, your lungs to draw breath today, that wouldn't be happening. Mary was important because of who God wanted her to be. Jesus was important because he was God himself. What makes you important, what, what the genesis is of the expectations you can have on yourself is knowing that God wants you to be great. God created you for greatness. You are great because God has a great plan for you. This is what Christmas is about. This is why it's so special when we get around Christmas because it reminds us that God thought so much of me that he sent Jesus to come to the earth to remind me of the fact that there's a God in heaven who made me and created me with purpose and destiny in my heart. And he wants me to win, not just in heaven someday, he wants me to win on this side of eternity because the Bible says when people see your good deeds, when people see your greatness, they'll glorify your Father in heaven. So I just want to remind you of something today, that you can expect out of yourself what God expects out of you. You don't have to create it yourself. This is the good news. You can just decide to agree with God about what he believes about you. God wants you to be blessed and highly favored. Jesus said in John chapter 14, he said, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works. I can believe that about myself. The God that created me said that I can. Here's, here's how most of us live life. God says, you're great. I've got a great plan for you. There's purpose on your life. You've, you've got a great future in store for you. And here's what we do. We're like, I don't really agree with any of that. You know, I'm just me and I'm just my last name and I'm just who I am and I'm just living my life, doing my thing. And we're so beat up by culture. We're so beat up by external situations and circumstances. We think about all the things we can't control and all the reasons why God really doesn't have a plan for our life and why we can't be great. And God's sitting there saying, hey, I don't need you to figure it out. I just need you to start agreeing with me about yourself. I need you to come into agreement with me. This is what God's like. I need you to come into agreement with me about how great you can be and how great I've created you to be. Because I've given you a fingerprint that no one else has to leave an imprint that nobody else can leave on the world. Jesus is a study of what happens when we expect the arrival of greatness in our lives. And some of us refuse to agree with God about our greatness and instead choose to settle. Here's one of the most tragic, sad things I've ever experienced in my life. Too many people have not become the person they were destined to become because they've become the person they settled for. There's so many places in all of our lives today, me included, I'm not, I'm not up here because I'm the paragon of this, that we've just become the person we've settled to be. Like, this is just who I am. I'm not really willing to pay the price for that. You know, greatness isn't for me. And I've decided I'm just going to settle for that. 
Too many people have missed out on what they could have been and what God wanted them to be because they just settled where they were. What if Mary chose to lower ex- her expectations and just see Jesus as a normal kid? Oh, you know, this angel came. I think I was on LSD. You know, I'd taken some ayahuasca, and I know that wasn't real. I was in the sweat lodge that night, and, you know, it was a hallucination. None of that was real. And so Jesus is, you know, Jesus is no big deal. She didn't do that, right? So Johann uh, Wolf, Wolfgang von Goethe said this. He said, when we treat a man as he is, we make him worse than he is. When we treat him as if he already were what he potentially could be, we make him what he should be. So read that again. When we treat a man as he is, we make him worse than he is. When we treat him as if he already were what he potentially could be, we make him what he should be. A Harvard professor named Robert Rosenthal conducted a study with elementary school teachers. In this study, a group of 18 elementary school teachers gave their students a special test that Rosenthal put together. The test predicted which children were primed for a boost in IQ over the next few years. The catch, of course, was that it was not a special test at all. It was just a general IQ test with a fancy sounding name, but the teachers didn't know this. Once the results came back, Rosenthal picked a random group of students from each classroom and told the teachers that these students were bloomers that were predicted to blossom into brilliant students. In reality, there was nothing different about these students from their peers. A few months later, the students were given another IQ test, and the results were astounding. Students who were labeled as bloomers, even though they were just simply average students to begin with, scored significantly higher on IQ tests than their peers. Why did this happen? Researchers have discovered that the improvement was due to the different way that the teachers treated the students that they expected to succeed. Compared to the other children in the class, the bloomers were given more feedback, allowed more time for answering questions, and generally received more smiles, nods, and gestures of approval from their teachers. In other words, when a teacher treated a student as if they were destined to become smart, even if they were average to start with, the student became smarter. This is the power of greatness in our lives. Here's how God's trying to teach you. God's, God's, God's trying to treat you. God's trying to treat you like you're great. God's trying to treat you like he's got a plan for your life. God's trying to treat you like your future is gonna gonna be hopeful and successful and there's gonna be great things that happen in your life. Why? Because how you treat people in your life is gonna determine what they become. If I treat my kids like they're not gonna win, if I treat my kids like they're not gonna be smart, if I treat my kids like, hey, it just is what it is and this is who we are and this is how life is, that's exactly what's gonna happen. But if I start to treat people around me like they're great, they can become great. I start to treat them with a positive attitude and say, you're gonna win, I know you're gonna win. I start to affirm the greatness in other people. You know what happens? I get surrounded with great people because I'm the belief in their life. But But this starts with us. It starts with us putting ourselves in a position where I expect greatness out of myself. This is what Jesus reminds us of. So your greatness is not about you. It's not just about, today is not just about, hey, you become great. It's about your role in God's plan. My my expectations can't just be about me becoming great. They're about helping other people become great. You know, um, I can clap for that, sure. So um, this past year, I went into this year and I... I, you know, I, I really enjoyed COVID. It was great. I took two years off from the gym, didn't work out. It was amazing. I loved it. And uh, I, really, I really decided going into this year, one of my goals was I was going to work out, be healthy, be really consistent in, in my discipline. And so one of the things that I did was I wanted to get around people that did that. I wanted to get around a person who expected a lot out of themselves. So I started, I reached out to Steve Weatherford, who's my friend, and I said, hey, Steve, can I just come work out with you? Like he's a pro, he's a pro athlete, taking two years off from the gym and then going and work out with a pro athlete. It's like there's different levels here. Some of you, you've like seen videos Steve posted where I'm like sucking eggs and he's like smiling. That's kind of been a lot of my life this year. 
But here's one of the things that I've realized in my own life this year. And that's that Steve exp- Steve's physical expectations out of himself related to his own personal greatness have allowed me to expect greater out of myself physically. That's the secret of your greatness. The secret of your greatness is when you become great in whatever area of your life that you can be great in, the people around you start to believe in themselves that they can be great too. And you can actually help them become greater in an area where you're personally great. That's the most beautiful thing about you stepping into greatness is the world becomes a better place because of your greatness. So Advent means arrival, the advent of greatness. One of the things I want to encourage you in in this season of your life is that every room you walk in, you think to yourself, man, greatness just arrived in this room. I am Advent. (laughs) Some of y'all celebrate Advent. I'm Advent because Jesus lives on the inside of me and he's got a plan for my life. And aren't you glad that Advent walked into the room today? Man, you guys are going to be so glad that greatness just walked into this place. Man, Christmas, it's gonna be the best Christmas ever because the advent showed up in your life. So the season reminds us of that, that Jesus has shown up in the world, he's shown up in our life, and he's gonna show up in the future. I wanna leave you with this. Three questions that can change your expectations. Number one, why not? What else are you going to do with your life? Why not see how far you can go, how much you can win, how much you can become, how great you can be, how much you can succeed, how how emotionally healthy you can be, how mentally healthy you can be, how physically healthy you can be. Why not see how much you can grow? After all, you're going to be here anyway. You might as well make it happen. Why not stay here in style? Then why not you? Why, Why... Why not you? Some people have done the most incredible things with a limited background. Some people do so well, they get to see it all. So why not you? And then why not now? Why postpone a better future when so much that's amazing awaits your life? Go get at it today. Get some new books. Make make a detailed plan for your life. Get coaching. Take someone out to lunch who can help you. Find ways to increase your productivity. Develop a lifestyle of generosity. Start loving people. Make a new effort to believe in yourself. And get moving in the right direction. These are the three questions I want you to think about yourself as it relates to your own personal greatness today. Why not? Why can't I win? Why can't I become healthy? Why can't I become successful? Why not me? Why can't I be the one? You know, a lot of us look around and we see other people that are successful and they're like, man, like, I wish that was me. Why not you? Let's go. Make it happen. And then number three, why not right now? Some of y'all wait until until January 1st to get started. Just get started right now. Soft launch this thing. Start beta testing your greatness today on your friends and family. Say, hey, I'm working on a new version of me when you go to Christmas this year. I'm working on being great, and I want to I show you guys the new and improved version of me today. And where all of this starts for us, where all of this ultimately starts and where it ends is with our relationship with Jesus. Because this isn't like me just giving, get up here and like, let's have a motivational seminar on a Sunday morning. This is all about the fact that we have to come to the place that we believe that true greatness starts with the arrival of the greatest thing that's ever happened in the history of the world, and that's Jesus. Not just into this, on this planet 2,000 years ago, but the arrival of Jesus into our lives. And before we move on with whatever else we got going on in our service, I want to give you an opportunity today to put yourself in a position where you have it right with Jesus. Because Jesus reminds us that there's great things in store for us, that God has a great plan for our life. The reason why Jesus came to the earth 2,000 years ago and he lived and he died was so that we could be connected to the source of all true greatness. Everything else is a poor imitation of having a relationship with God. So I want to invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. This isn't like some emotional moment or emotional decision that I want us to make. If you want to really be great, If you want to be the person that you know that you can be, that starts with getting your life in the right place with Jesus, getting your life in the right place with God. And it's as simple as believing this in your heart and just praying a prayer. And I want to lead you in a prayer today, whether you're watching online or you're here in this room. 
Everyone that can hear my voice, just pray this prayer and repeat after me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for choosing me. I repent of my sins. I give you my life. Help me to become great. In your name I pray, amen. Can we give those people that made that decision a big hand?